Hey, is that Hello, Davis? Courtney's okay, but still, okay. it was boring yeah. compared to. <laughs> yeah. uh, is she the oldest or youngest? She's the oldest. Yeah, Opal, Courtney and Opal are over there. She's looking at. Oh, me. there she is. Okay. All right. All right. You want me to run the one, 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 one. Okay, I can do either way. Okay. Good luck. Sure.
Good morning, everyone. Let's stand and let's worship together. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray all the whole day through, there's a silver light that shines in the Possible. The reason is, is we need to know how many people are coming so that we can have all of the food bought and all that. So please, 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 if you are plan if your child is planning to go to camp 7th through 12th, please sign them up as soon as possible. We would appreciate that greatly because that happens next Sunday is when we will leave for that right after worship. So be planning on that. If you haven't signed up, please do that. I think that's all for our uh, announcements today. We are glad that you are here. I know that Nathan will have you stand up again, so let's just stand up and remain and continue worshiping. Stand up. 
I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he is made me glad. He is made me glad. He is made me glad. I will rejoice for he is made me glad. He is made me come together to partake of the Lord's table. For the last two weeks I've been thinking about the Lord's table. Been thinking about what it looks like, what it really means. How many of you have ever lost a friend when they found out a secret about you? How many of you would be mortified if your friend or your spouse knew that dark, deep down buried thing that you're so terrified, if they found it out, they wouldn't love me. Can you identify that one? Do you see it? Does it run through your mind and you think, oh, will today be the day that they know? Will they still love me? Jesus says in Matthew 23 and verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Here's a man Here's the Son of God crying over Jerusalem for all of the history of Jerusalem. And his heart breaks because he knows their deep, dark secrets. He knows the secrets inside those that are plotting to kill him. And he still yearns to love them and gather them together. At this time, we celebrate. We come together to remember our Lord and Savior. The one who knows your darkest secrets still loves you, still went to a cross to redeem you, to make you his own. We partake of the bread which represents his body broken on a cross. 
And he asks that we do it in remembrance of him. Each time we partake of it, the human sacrifice to bring you back into a relationship with God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you love us no matter what we do. You love us in spite of our sins, in spite of our, of our failings. Father, it's our prayer that each of us looks deep in our hearts and we find the things that are not pleasing to you and we bring them to you and we ask for forgiveness. We ask that as we partake of your son's body that we find peace and solace in the fact that he died for us so that we could have a relationship with you and him forever. Father, help us not to do this lighthearted. Help us to do this with a pure and sincere heart. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. How many of you would fight to protect the ones you love? Young people, would you, for, would you fight to protect your brothers and sisters? Married couples, would you fight per, to protect your spouse? If another human comes to harm your family, would you stand in the way to protect them? The second part of the Lord's Supper is partaking of the fruit of the vine, which to us symbolizes Christ's blood. Christ fought for you and me. He fought the powers of Satan and bought you with his blood. And he won that fight. For all of eternity, he won. And at this time, we partake of this cup to remind us of the blood that he paid to buy our souls.
Father, we continue our praise. We continue our rejoicing in the power of Christ, in his love for each one of us that he would die in our place to buy our souls from hell. Father, we pray that our hearts are pure. We pray that we give ourselves to you and live a life that you called us to live and that we do it with gladness and with rejoicing and with all of our soul and our might because his blood makes it possible. Father, we rejoice in the forgiveness of sins through Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Another aspect of worship is giving. We hear it all the time, give, 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 give. Nonprofits call and solicit for giving. Your kids look and say, gimme, 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 gimme. But this is separate, this is special. What have you given to God this past week? What are you going to give to God this afternoon? What are you going to give to God tomorrow at work? God bankrupted heaven for our salvation. He gave the most precious thing that he had. For you parents, can you imagine sacrificing your child? For the most hideous society in the world, in creation, just to redeem them and bring them back. 
What will you give to God? At this time, we pass baskets to take up a collection. But God wants more than your money. Give generously. Give with a purpose. Financially, physically, emotionally, and mentally. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all the blessings you pour out on us. You give us everything that we need to survive. You make our hearts beat. You make the air that we breathe. Father, you put the clothes on our back. You open the doors for employment and for education. Father, help us always to remember that our blessings flow from your throne. And as a result of those blessings, we should be honored and willing to give back to help others. Thank you for all that you do for us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This is our fifth Sunday, and for many of you that may not be here or participated with one of our fifth Sundays before, we also have a potluck dinner after worship today for anybody that wants to partake of that, and we'd love for you to stay around and be a part of that. Uh, but also on the fifth Sunday, we also have a baby blessing, and these are for babies that have been born since the last fifth Sunday, and I don't think we even had a baby blessing to fifth Sunday last time, but today we do. And so I'd like to invite Kurt and Riata Brown up and want to show you Riken Reeves Brown and little sister Anley, or big sister Anley. And I asked the elders if they would come on up here too and surround this family. There may be, we also have made it a custom that if you are a family that would, uh, has a child that you would like to have us bless, this is something that Jesus did. In Mark chapter 10, we see him when he gathered around the families and he uh, had these children in his arms and he blessed them. And so we are excited today to bless Riken and this family, the Brown family. And Gerald's going to come and do that at this time. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father and our God, you have so richly blessed us here at Lycoma. Father, each and every week seems like we are announcing new members. Thank you so much for that for bringing them our way. And Father, we are thankful this morning for the new babies that have arrived. We especially want to pray this morning for the Brown family. Father, we know that you are the giver of life. And Father, we just pray that as we worship here as a family, that we will be a family to the Browns, that we will give them the support and the encouragement they need to raise their, their family up in this atmosphere. But Father, we pray especially for, for them as they raise their children, give them the strength that they need to be the good example that they need to be. 
and for us to be the example we need to be to our children. Father, we love you and we so much appreciate what you've done through this congregation, the blessings you have provided for us. And I'm thankful for each and every one of our members, especially our young. And Father, the fussing and the crying that we sometimes hear. is not a nuisance. It is an encouragement. There are so many congregations in our, in our membership that do not have the young families that they need. And I pray, Father, that you will be with them as they struggle to survive. But Father, we look around and we are truly blessed. I thank you, Father, for your love, for your patience, and thank you for blessing us with new lives. And Father, again, I just pray that you be with the Browns and all of those, even those that are expecting babies. We need to pray for them and their health and look forward to where we can stand up here and bless that family also. Father, again, thank you for your tremendous love for us and be with us as a family as we continue to worship today. In Christ's name, amen. One of the things I forgot at the beginning of the service, but Willie in his prayer, last prayer for the offering, maybe reminded me of this is that we had a lot of giving going on yesterday. And Andrew Brock, where is he? Come up here. Andrew and Andrew uh, did a great job of helping us out with an event that is now our third year in uh, doing, and that's helping with the firefighters in their big uh, freedom celebration. We also, at the Freedom Celebration, I don't want Andrew to forget this, I would like for him, we also had a bunch of our people that gave out glow sticks to all the 10,000 people that were coming there. I know you didn't have 10,000 glow sticks, but y'all were doing that too. And so Andrew's gonna tell us a little bit about that and uh, have most of y'all stand up. And so we wanna honor you today. Thank you for giving of your time. Thank you, James. Uh, do we have those slides up? So this was posted, uh, I'm sure many of you saw this last night. Um, thank you to Lake Homa Church of Christ and there are more than 70 volunteers that helped serve dinner tonight at our Freedom Celebration. We couldn't do it without you. If you were a part of this last night, if you were wearing a blue shirt or if you were not wearing a blue shirt and you helped out, please stand at this time. Thank you. And there's many that are not here that, that did help. We have grown to uh, now people of the community want to help us hand and serve people as well. So it's a, it's a very cool thing um, to be a part of. I wanted to share a couple of these posts. And these are from a couple members, but most people from the community. You can read them, right? We love Lake Homa. Always doing good things. Thank you so much. The first one, that it was, uh, it's very, very hot, but they continued to work. One that, I, that really pointed out to me that I love, it is so cool, is Way to Go Lake Homa. Seen you volunteering at City Rescue Mission downtown Oklahoma City too. That is amazing. So to the teens, that's a shout out to you guys right there. Lake Homa is in the community. We're very present. Um, where they're very aware that we're around and it's, uh, it's amazing. So many people thanked us. And it's just such a great job. I'll leave that last comment out. Nobody needs to know that, right? <laughs> That's the city manager of Mustang, right? So everybody knows about us. It's not the city manager of Mustang? Councilman. Councilman, that's right. So still, that's pretty high up, right? Um, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the firefighters, real quick story, came up to me last night and he said, thank you guys so much. This has grown so much bigger than we could have possibly ever imagined. He said when we started, it was all the, the, the firefighters that were serving, 
and only 40 volunteers, and that's it. We have 70 just at the food tent, the drink tent, and of course the watermelon stand. Okay, that's just our small part, and there's so many other people that help put this thing on. It was such a good time. And like James mentioned, as the lights go down, as it gets darker and darker, all you can see are those glow sticks that Carrie and Brad and so many others helped out pass out. It was such an amazing thing to be a part and in that community. It's growing every year. We ask that we had 70, over 70 this year. Please come out and enjoy helping us out next year. It was such a great time. Thank you very much. Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. He chose the seed of Israel's race, he ransomed from the fall. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them that they cho chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all of the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Let's pray again together. Our Father and our God, how thankful we are that we can be here this morning to sing songs of praise to you, to worship you. And Father, we look forward to hearing a sermon from your word, words of encouragement for us, for what you've done for us. And Father, just words cannot express what you've done through your Son, Jesus Christ, your Son. 
who was offered as a sacrifice for our sins. And Father, without that sacrifice, we would be truly miserable and truly lost. But through that, Father, we are not under the death penalty of sin. For you have freed us from that through your Son. And Father, we just pray that you, we will always remember that as we live our life. Let us be the examples that we need to be. Let us ever draw strength from you. Let us be a prayerful congregation. Father, we love you and we cherish the time that we have together. Father, we have a number of our members that are suffering, either due to loss of loved ones, like the Reeds, those that are suffering with serious illnesses, and Father, we want to bring them up to you this morning in prayer that you will be with them and give them strength to make it through these ordeals. Father, we pray for comfort and peace in their lives. <clears throat> Father, we pray that we as a family will all join hands together to help them make it through these difficult times. Father, we have those that are struggling with marriage issues. And Father, we just pray that your hand will intervene in those and they may be rectified. Father, we do love our young children, our young teens, and Father, those that are just young in heart. We are so thankful for them and the strength and the example that they have for us. Father, I know the hearts of this congregation. I know how much they love you. And Father, we just pray that that will ever strengthen, that the works we do here at Lake Homa will reach out not only to the community, as is mentioned earlier, but throughout the world. But because our job is to sow the seed. Father, help us be bold in that. Father, we have many talents here, and we thank you for that. But we have so many talents that are unused. Let us not be afraid to step forward and use those talents that you have given us to the best of our ability <clears throat> to serve you and spread your word. Father, we pray that you will be with us as we continue on in our worship service, that everything we do will be in accordance to your will and be pleasing to you. Be with our hearts as we continue to worship. In Christ's name, amen. Stand up and sing for the sermon today.
It is nice to be here, to be with you, to be invited. You've got the legacy of people like uh, Bob Gregg and James Waugh. Those are blessings. And you have uh, the reputation of being a working congregation, as is demonstrated by uh, what we've seen even today, what you have celebrated. I'm uh, one of those Southwest Oklahoma people. There is a lot of them, and many of our paths, several of you in this building, I, we've passed, crossed paths the course of the year. The, uh, my younger years as I grew up on a cotton farm, plowing, working. Distance runner in high school, graduated Oklahoma Christian, then went into full-time work. My bride of over 50 years is here with us today, Janine, sitting back with the Henrys. I knew Jerry Don when he was that big. That was before last week. <clears throat> but I've known them good people, very good people. And then we have been going to various congregations and working through the years. Till about four years ago, right about now, we retired, and I got to do less. Well, let's say it this way. I have not been to an elders meeting in four years. I am looking younger and feeling better. <laughs> Nothing against elders. It's just it's work. It's work. And, uh, but I'm teaching lots of classes at Memorial Road, which is where we attend. We live in the Edmond area now. Now, that's something about me. Now you kind of know who I am. But, you know, uh, 500 years ago, God was busy doing His work in various parts of the world. A uh, hundred years from now, if the earth continues, He'll continue His work. On Sundays, we get a chance to kind of put everything back in perspective, is that we're just kind of here for a while, and we will kind of do His work as best we can figure it out. And you have been blessed to have been placed in this atmosphere and then we'll get back out and do it again until we finally sleep, and then we will go on. Uh, this is, uh, well, come tomorrow, we enter an important month for me because uh, it, it is on, in, down in the latter part of this next month, July, I will turn 70. Now, I know I don't look that old. Not a day over 68, probably. But that's sobering. It says in the Bible that your life is 70 years, so I'm fixing to die, I guess. And if by reason of strength you might make it to 80. Now, the good news is my father lived to be 92. And mother is 90, almost 91. So I got longevity. But I'm about to hit that age where I have every right in the world to feel kind of bad. And so, there is still work for us to be done. There are so many people. One man reached the end point of his life. His name was Hewlin. This was a number of years ago. He, he, he wasn't going to live long. He didn't really go to church much. But I went over to visit him because they'd gotten some real bad news recently. I went in the door. His wife was an extremely faithful Christian. She met me at the door in their little humble house, and she said, I doubt if he will last two more weeks. Well, what do you say to that? So I went down the hall, turned left into his bedroom that had been all set up for him with his little magazines, and the window was open, and he could hear the <clears throat> outside sounds and trees and, and such, and and I could hear Tennessee Ernie Ford playing softly in the distance. And I said, Hewlin, we talked for a while, and he said, it's pretty bad. I said, Hewlin, what are you thinking about now? And he said, I'm thinking about I'm at a dead end. He really was. He wasn't going to last much longer and did not last much longer. I didn't know what he was thinking, but I asked him, and he said, I'm, I'm at a dead end. Then I knew what he was thinking. What are you thinking? 
You got all kinds of impressions. You might be thinking about, you know, what I look like or sound like or remind you of and so forth. And, but I would have to ask you what you're thinking to know what you're thinking. Now, a passage of Scripture was read to us moments ago that is rather unusual because what was said in the passage well ago was it told you something of what God was thinking. Do you ever kind of wonder about, what's God thinking about? Now, we kind of pose it because we wonder, why on earth is He allowing certain things? But in the text, it was read to you from Genesis 6. It was a long time ago. It says, God saw and God thought. Do you understand what's being told us there? It is telling you what God thinks about what God saw. That doesn't happen very often. And God was deciding, I'm going to do something about what I see. It tells us something about God when we know what He's thinking. It tells us something about humans when we read that and understand what He's thinking. And it also tells us how bad the world was for God to think about destroying it the way He did and the way it's described in Genesis 6. Where is the good news in something like this so long ago? Today, I want to uh, remind us of something, some things about God. What, is it ta- what are we talking about when we say God? I want to remind us of some of that because I want us to know and be refreshed with an understanding because we have come together, we see God better. In a 2004, almost a quarter of a million people were killed by that tsunami in ocean, in the Indian Ocean. Remember that? 2004. The next year was Hurricane Katrina. Over 1,800 people died in that one. And on the front of magazines and in various places around our world, they said, where is God in this? It just did not seem compatible for God to have allowed that many people to die with various natural phenomena, and people took on God, and they wanted to figure out why He was saying those various things. Now, let's think about Genesis 6, God, who had made the world, thought these things. He is Creator. Well, even our children could tell us that. You know what that means? That means God made the world out of something that had not existed before. Now, you and I can kind of put things together and form a birdhouse if you're real good. Glue it together, nail it together, screw it together, put it together. But you have to understand that when it says God is creator, he created some, it out of nothing. And when we talk about that, we're talking about something that if he had not caused it to be, it would not exist. So, let's just say, you understand, God didn't mix some things together to corn blue. He made blue out of nothing. That when he made place, you're not there, you're here, place. He made that. It does not exist in His world. Place is here. Time is here. He made it. He made it so that there is a yesterday, and He made it so there is a tomorrow, and that we happen to be now. But God is not limited by that. He made time out of nothing. So when we talk about God... We really need to raise our sights so that we understand we're talking about a being who made stuff out of nothing and that he is not contingent. You know how we say things, I'll be there, if we're really uppity we might say as my mother would sometimes say, if you're not uppity you would say, well that's contingent upon our being able to get home in time. What do I mean by that? That means that depends if we get there in time. God is a non-contingent being. He doesn't depend on anything. 
He doesn't need you for anything. He has never needed anybody for anything. Non-contingent. A number of years ago, I uh, was in a class. I heard a man speak who was a philosopher at the University of Texas, Jay Budzuski. Uh, you probably have never heard of him, but he was well known, uh, kind of an unbeliever who became a believer. And he said some things and wrote a wonderful little book. It was called How to Stay Christian in College. I still read and reflect on that book. But I want to give you a little quote of something he said about God. He said, God does not depend upon anything else because he is what everything else depends upon. He can't be explained by anything else because he is what everything else must be explained by. Although we can know what he has taught us about himself, we can never comprehend him completely because he is greater than our minds. Now, there's more. People sit around and they say, I just don't understand God. That's true, and you never will. You put all the brain power in the world together. You will never understand. But I need to understand God. Well, you don't understand what God is then. Because your mind is incapable of understanding the vastness which is God. But he's taught us a few things. Enough so that we can place our faith in him and trust him with the rest. He not only holds, Jay goes on, supreme power. He uses it. Nothing can defeat him. Nothing can happen contrary to his will. He is also supremely good, light with no darkness. Although evil is real, he detests it and brings it to judgment. He knows everything. He pays attention to everything. Nothing escapes his notice. God's creator and unique. We say of him also that he is holy. When we say God is holy, we do not mean, when God is, is love, we do not mean by that to say, God is special. God is extra good. He's extra righteous. He's extra loving. No, it's not even in a dimension that we can understand. When we're talking about God being holy, a better word for that is He is so, you know, kind of separated and away from us. He is so other than us. We were made in His image, but we are not little gods. He is so other than us. That's what God is. God is also like a father who loves his children, a mother who loves her children, a husband who loves his wife. He is, he's not just all of this. He has a characteristic and trait about himself in which he is intimate with people. He cares about human beings who are limited in the way they can do it. He is not need, a needy, loving being. He doesn't need to be loved. He doesn't extend love so that you will love him. He doesn't do that. What he does is he is just giving love. That's it. Yeah, but what are the strings? No strings. He's just giving love. And one more thing about him. It was seen in Genesis 6 that it came to a time when the world was just corrupt. And it was probably, you know, a lot of people on the earth. And it was just, there were just no good thoughts. I know you think today's bad, but this probably was quite a bit worse. And as you looked around, that is another aspect of God. Let's look at Romans chapter 5. And this is out of, outside of uh, Genesis 6. This is the only other passage I want us to think about. This first few verses, but we're going down first to look at the sixth verse. You see, this is in Romans 5, 6. You see. 
just at the right time, when we were still powerless, the word is helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. And then we've heard this before. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his lone love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Human beings have this ability to say no to God. We've seen it since Adam and Eve. We've seen it in the days of Noah. We've just seen it amongst all of humans. You have the right and privilege to say no. How does God deal with that? How God deals with that is he is a relentless, and this is another trait of his. He pursues. He is like a, res a relentless lover. Remember when you were in high school or college or Maybe last week, and you had someone you liked, and you, they liked you for a while, and then they didn't like you anymore, but you still liked them, and you pursued them, and they didn't really like you pursuing them. But you were just kind of a, or the tables were turned. Someone pursued you. You're like a relentless lover. I care for them. I care for them. But they don't care for you. I care for them. There is that attribute about God as signaled by what Paul said here. He is very much concerned about what he has. We may not want his love, but he wants us. So this is what uh, is going on. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. The bad news is there is this mess in the world. And you know, we don't, we're, we're not way back there, but put your mind there. This is the God that is faced with the situation of a world gone bad. It is totally messed up. It is bad. And so God, God comes, and he looks, and, he's, and he thinks, I've got to do something about this. I have to. That's the bad news. The bad news from Genesis chapter 6 is I've got to do something about this because, because he is special and holy and does what is right. He cannot put this off for long. Now, we have a choice, and we make a choice, and we have to live with the choices. I have a grandchildren, I have four grandchildren, but imagine uh, if you said to, say, my 10-year-old, all right, we're going on a trip, and you are going to pick where we're going, and you're going to pick all the meals and where we stay. Try to imagine that. We, what can you eat for breakfast according to what a 10-year-old wants? If they set the course, the choices are not nearly what mama and dad will do. God looks at a world that has made bad choice after bad choice, almost to the point now they cannot make any good ones anymore. So what God says, this God who, who made all of this and loves like he did and loves like we will learn in the rest of the Bible, did all of that, something has to happen. And what happened there was, God sent a flood. Now we know what God thought and we know what He's like because we have the benefit of the rest of the Bible. We know what God thought and God had to do something and so He did. God did not create evil. He created everything. He did not create evil. You know that? God had to do something. He had to deal with evil. Well, where did evil come from? Uh, best answer I've heard on some of that is evil was not created. God did not set up, now I will make evil to give people a choice. I, he didn't do that. Evil is the corruption of good things. It's where you take something good and make it bad. Think about evil. That's what happens if you're talking about adultery. You've got marriage and what's supposed to happen in marriage, and then you've got a distortion of that. Telling the truth, not telling the truth, distortion of telling the truth, and so forth. And the master of that is, of course, Satan. And so what God sees happening in his world is people have taken the good and they have distorted it, and it is all over the earth, and he must do something. And the bad news, he does it. He does it. So Noah builds his boat, gets in his boat, eight are saved, lifted into a 
off of the earth with the water and then that's, you know, that's the bad news for all those who were left out of the ark. But the good news is there was an ark and people were in it. In Romans 5, thousands of years later, after Jesus had lived and died, Paul said, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. It is impossible for our God, who patiently looks at our world and patiently looked at the ancient world, to overlook sin for long. Can't do it. We know that. It scares us. Human beings really need help. They needed help back then. There was an ark, but that was it. And what human beings need is to be able to fix themselves. And God looked at humans, and humans can't fix themselves. You ever thought about doing surgery on yourself? Hope you never have to try lose a lot of patience that way, and you only get one chance if you're operating on yourself. Imagine eye surgery. That's fairly delicate, just saying, all right, now I'm going to try to do that on myself. Human beings cannot take care of the issue. They cannot take care of the problem they have between them and God. But here comes Jesus. We have moved away from the flood, and, and when you move away from the flood, in the book of Genesis, you will find then God picks a family, Abraham, and he begins to sweep through and bring blessing into the world. And then as you study through Isaiah, my men's group on Thursdays for the last year spent time looking at Isaiah, and you see God sweeping into history what he intends to do in the future, and it'll involve far more than Israel. And then when it finally happens, here is Jesus now in the New Testament, and God is doing something with Jesus like he had done something with Israel, and he is then working. And then here you and I are 2,000 years this side of that. And we look back with quite a bit of vision. But when God was working with Israel, like David and the others, when God was working with the prophets, when God was working through those people in the intervening centuries, He knew there was more to the problem than in getting Israel to sacrifice better or smarter. He knew the kind of debt that stood between Solomon and others and anybody that had ever lived, what stood between them and God was that Jesus was needed to pay a debt nobody else could pay. That debt needed to be human. It couldn't be animal. They'd They'd done a lot of those sacrifices, and animal's not human. Man is in the image of God. And it couldn't be angel because angels were created beings too, and they're not in the image of God. And you look around the universe and you wind out, it, it's going to have to be something that's like God. So God said, I'll take care of that. The size of what God must do is, is bigger. I mean, I'm going to have to be able to... He's going to have to be able to cover the sins here and all the things that people do during their life, what people have done in other places and all the multitudes of various nations that exist in the world who lean upon Jesus. He's going to have to be, that, that is going to demand multiple, that infinite resources. Jesus paid that debt too. And whoever does it had better be free of debt. You don't come here and make mistakes, and then when you've made your mistakes, you think you can do better than my mis You can cover my mistakes. No, you're not going to do that. And if you could find someone in heaven like this and bring them to earth like Jesus, and then they come, if they come and then you force them to die, you've stolen their life from them. They must volunteer. So Jesus, to pay the debt, must volunteer to do it. 
And he did. When all the apostles ran off, the Romans kind of let them go because they weren't much of a threat. But Jesus stood there and just trusted God to take him on through it. This is the message that we love. This is the message that was very much in the song you just sung moments ago. The living hope. Periodically, we need to stop and look back at it and say, yeah, that's what we're all about. We're a group of people who are try we're trying to live good and live fine, but what we are are the people of God who believe in the resurrection of Jesus, and we intend to work for that cause till he takes us away. That's who we are. That's what a Christian is. What God thinks. Once upon a time, we heard what that was. In Jesus, we can kind of watch it too. But a better question might be, not just what does God think, but what does God think about me and what has He done for me? Well, for a long time He may have overlooked your sins, but eventually He will judge them. Unless we take care of them in Jesus. Hewlin told me, I'm at a dead end. I'm at a dead end. He would have liked to have backed up and lived a different life. He said, I'm at a dead end now. I had others who said or reached the same point and said, I'm going to change my life, but they died before they did that. I don't know what your situation is, but this God of the Bible is the one that is. And I wanted to paint for you kind of a little clearer picture of the greatness of this God you depend upon. You can love and trust Him. But do not be mistaken. He is very mindful of, He sees everything. He is mindful of what you have done. But he doesn't want you to hang on to it. He wants you to lay it on Jesus because Jesus paid the debt. When we sing this song in just a matter of minutes, I, I want you to consider what you might need to do. If you need to give your life to Jesus, then, of course, baptism is the way we enter into that covenant relationship with him. And if you haven't done that, you need to do that amongst friends and, and make that particular commitment. And the second thing is, those of you who've made this commitment, which is the vast majority of you, you need to be reminded that the God that I have described for you is the same one who intends to keep you close to himself. He is not looking for a way to throw you out. He is looking for a way to help you love him even more. That God who calls you is the same God who is able to keep you saved. And that's wonderful. You have listened well. Now it is time for you to respond if you need to. Let's sing this song and invite you to come forward. He is able more than able to accomplish what concerns me today.
Jesus is 